All right, so I'm at Merit Partners in uh, just outside of Atlanta, Georgia, and uh, I got my friend Eric Joseph, who is a registered trainer, a registered, what do we call trainer, it? Trainer, RT. RT, registered trainer through the uh, IDA, International Details, Detailers Association. And I've gone through the process of when I become a member, mm -hmm. uh, and then I became a certified detailer by taking the 10 exams. Uh, and then the one part I'm missing is phase two, which is SV, which is skills verified. Uh, and the reason I'm doing this, of course, I'm not a pro detailer. I don't propose to be one, uh, but I like to do things professional grade if I can. Uh, I've been trained by many, many different, uh, like Jason, the Jason Roses and Todd Coop writers of the world. Uh, and uh, I've done the Crystal Serum Ultra certification. Mm -hmm. So I'm a big proponent of pursuing and chasing knowledge. It's, this is interesting to me. I really like doing this. Uh, and so some would maybe question why I would go through this process of getting skills verified. To me, again, I find it interesting and the pursuit of knowledge is important. So why not get some letters behind my name if I can sure. help it? And I was a financial advisor for many, many years and I had, I think I had 32 letters behind my name, not for the vanity of it, but for the fun, the pursuit of knowledge, the pursuit sure. of information. And so the process in the future for me after this is done, I'll have continuing ed, right? Mm -hmm. So I'll have to do eight hours of continuing ed uh, through either some sort of uh, event, like going to a training or going to an actual physical, like a G-Technic training or mm -hmm. something like that in the future. So uh, Eric's gonna take us through or take me through getting verified. This is the test that you would give a detailer or anybody wanting to become phase two mm -hmm. SV, right? Sure. So what do we do, where do we start? So you start just like the SAT. So we're gonna go back to high school, okay. and you're gonna fill out the top. Okay. If you can't fill out your name right. We're not off to a good start. We're not off to a good start. All right, so my name, Matt Mormon. So while you do that, we'll just mm -hmm. talk about the space we're in a little bit, right? I don't think it's every day that we get such a, um, as you would say, you know, almost dialed in wash bay. Yeah. Um, I don't know if we've ever done a skills validation um, or a skills verified testing, depending who you talk to. Uh, with a Carrera GT. But that's just, this is his old hat to me. This is how I roll, dude. That's this it. Is how I do things. That's it. So, um, you know, we will let the viewers know. We are going to have some detailers behind the scenes kind of finishing off the car just because we're not going to sit here and wait for Matt to wash an entire car by himself. Um, it is late on Sunday after the Serum Summit. I think we're all a little tired, but um, I think it's going to be a good time. So normal SV, I wouldn't uh, would I start to th do the start to finish, do the car? So or? I guess it would depend on how we wanted to really do it. We've done in group environments, so like Mobile Tech Expo is a pretty good one. I think we, mm -hmm. we did at least 20 or so skills validated testing. Obviously, we can't wash a car inside of it. There was carpeting summer. down, right? Yes, yes, rather so, Vegas -y carpet. So have they given you as a recognized trainer the ability to, there's a certain set of things that have to be done, parameters, but you're, there's some subjectivity in this? Correct, so we started building this, uh, I know we did the first one in the beginning of 2015. Mm -hmm. So this has been around and evolving for the last five years and probably multiple years before that okay. of, of thought. I came on um, as a, I got my SV in the beginning of 2015. Okay. And the RT a couple of years later. Okay. So um, I've seen it done throughout the country. I've seen it done multiple ways. We do have a little artistic license. But we just want to make sure that the skills are validated or sure. verified and that the bases are really covered. Got it. Got it. So we're not, we're not yucking this up for the camera. I wanted not to go, uh, there's a bunch of real pros around here probably <laughs> going to be giving me uh, you know, the stink eye when I'm uh, doing things, but I want to be truly certified. I sure. want to make sure that what I've been doing is proper uh, and, uh, and I want to get docked if it's, you know, if it's warranted and we'll, we'll show everybody the score. <laughs> uh, and so this will be the same process that, you know, you, if you're a detailer and you're watching this, that you'll go through. All Absolutely. right. So what do I do? I'm, I'm at your mercy. I don't know how this goes. So first things first, we're going to go take a walk over to we'll call it the chemical table okay. which is next to our sink and next to someone's pressure washer setup okay we'll talk about that and figure that out and as we walk over here we don't have a ton of stuff because this is just rather you know put up and put together mm -hmm. um, so the first thing that we're going to talk about and you can show me a few things here but we really want to focus on personal protection on personal safety okay right? so if you can identify a few things on the table that you would find in the personal protection equipment category. Um, and then we'll talk about some of the things that maybe you think we're missing or you think that detailers should or shouldn't use. Well, I mean, gloves would be pretty obvious. Absolutely. Right? So 
these, uh, I know that uh, I tend to use nitro rubber because there are some chemicals that'll you know, eat right through that. Yeah. So we'd have rubber gloves, and then um, depending on, I guess, ventilation, you could wear some sort of respirator. Absolutely. We could also consider putting on some sort of eye protection. You know, depending on, I, I'm guessing a normal washing environment, I probably wouldn't need that, but that's a couple of things that I could do. Obviously, also, I'd want to keep my, uh, my power cords out of any water situation as well, I would think. Very it good. would be important. Very good. All right, so we got gloves off the table, so on and so mm -hmm. forth. Mm -hmm. So that was question one. Got it. So question two, we're going to do a walk-around assessment of the vehicle's exterior. You're okay. going to tell me what you see. Mm -hmm. You're going to tell me what you may or may not be concerned with. Okay. You're going to identify anything that possibly you would go back to the customer or client and let them know about because yeah. it's just really going to irk you. I've already walked around this when I first got here. Uh, there's no PPF paint protection film on this car. Uh, the way that I did that was kind of feel edges. Uh, there is uh, windshield protection, so okay. I'm going to want to watch the edge of that, I think. Um, I didn't know it was notice any blemishes or scratches or dings or dents, so I, I'm hoping that you know I won't put any in. Um, and so uh, the car, the paint condition looks pretty good. I don't notice there's not a lot of scratches and swirls in, in the surface, so it looks you know it looks pretty good. The one thing I did identify that I would address would be uh, tire nibs. That's probably not on the test, but I, <laughs> may I suggest to the IDA that this is added that the denibbing should be a part of the. Uh, the, uh, the de-nibbing process? Yeah. So wheels, I don't notice any curb rash. Okay. Tires look in good condition. Doesn't look like there's a ton of dressing on the tire, so that's a good thing. Um, lights look good. Exhaust looks clean. Um, so I don't notice anything that I would need to address with the, uh, okay. with the client. So let's use the first two letters of the car mm -hmm. and change it to a Camry. Okay. So if you were dealing with your neighbor's Camry, mm -hmm. Florida, right? Yes. That hasn't been washed in, say, three and a half months. Okay. What are some things that the detailers that are staring at us may come in contact with every day that would take a little more effort to remove? Uh, bird dropping would be one. Tar would be another. Uh, road paint could be a third. No. You know, um, water spots. Mm -hmm. Um, and then general contamination, which I'd be able to feel with my hand. Sure. You know, if uh, you know that, if I wanted to, you know, like this car is pretty dialed in, so I wouldn't drag my hand across it. But you know, if it were a Camry and it looked all scratched up, I might not worry as much. But it generally do that with soap and water. I could tell contamination-wise. Sure. But those would be some things that would be. You could also have you know the yellowed and damaged headlights. Mm -hmm. UV could be Toyota. Could be damaged. Yeah. Toyota. Pretty much guaranteed. All right. You ready for question three? Yep. It's gonna be difficult for you, not in theory. It's gonna be difficult for you in application and vision. We're gonna go build wash buckets. Oh Lord, okay, I got it. Yeah, you were supposed to have my wash buckets here for this test, but- They were um, left up at Atlanta Motorsports Park. Okay, so, you know, I'm generally gonna look for, we have grid guard here, we also have a washboard. Uh, I'm not a big fan of the washboard, but that, I understand the concept. The first thing I would inspect would be, you know, there's some debris in the buckets. Yes, there is. So I'd wanna, I don't know if that was part of the test, <laughs> but um, I would wanna get all the debris out of the buckets, add a grit guard. Um, there are many different methods that I could use. I could use a single bucket method and multiple towels. I think for this, um, this application, I would do two buckets, so two bucket method. One with a grit guard and a washboard, the other with is that uh, a, just a grit guard. Is that a dialed in, obsessed garage approved bucket? Yeah, this is not. <laughs> Another thing it could, you could do, which I would probably do since I have my choices here, is I'd do one bucket in a different color. So this would be my rinse bucket and this would be my wash bucket, if you will. So I'd visit this bucket first and then I'd visit the white bucket second. If it were me, I would label it and have a nice, you know, nice logo. Maybe that'd be on larger wheels than what you would buy from, say, right. Home Depot. Right. I'd also might suggest the IDA do, uh, I, I'm supposed to be being tested here, we go to six <laughs> gallon buckets instead of five. Now, you did talk about that at the Serum Summit. Why is that? Six gallon bucket, there's less probability I'd need to refill and add more water to the bucket. Correct. It's like if you're working on a Raptor or something like that, that extra gallon of water Helps out. means that I won't have to go re, you know, add more soap and okay. agitate it. How about for a wheel bucket? How would you build that out? Um, personally, I don't use a wheel bucket. Uh, what I do is I have a pressure washer gun in my left hand and I'll spray off my 
utensils. So I'll have my wheel bucket would sit with a grit guard in it. I won't, wouldn't fill it with water. Um, what I would do is um, I would uh, take my gun in my left hand. I'd have whatever, pressure washer gun. Pressure washer gun. Yes, yeah, yes. yeah. And I would take and have you know my utensils. So I would use various part. You know, so I'd use this, I guess, for the face of the wheel. This for the barrels. I would have a tire brush. You might avoid the uh, wire brush. That's probably we, not suggested. We did try to trick you. Um, I have my wash media for um, for the uh, for the for the washing the car. And so um, the way I would do it is, which I, um, you might have me show, is um, I'm gonna like for the tires. I'm gonna spray it off with my yeah. with my pressure washer. Let's gun. go. Let's go over to the wall and get it done. Okay. Wheels first. So the way I would set it up, the way I do it is I'm going to do wheels first and then grab a wheel cleaner of some sort. All right, so I'm looking at what materials we have here. And uh, the only thing I didn't uh, mention, the thing I didn't think about, this is carbon ceramic brakes. Mm -hmm. um, certain wheel cleaners are fine on them, so some may not. Uh, so based on, you know, I'm not familiar with some of these products, uh, and so based on this application, I think I will mix up soap in my bucket and clean it using, uh, using just the regular soap, regular sure. wash. So I'm going to change up my procedure a little bit and use the fourth bucket. So I'm going to take a grit guard. I'm going to add a little soap and water. So if you're not familiar with the product, what would you look for? Uh, you generally follow instructions, right? So, um, let's see, G wash, instructions, directions for use would be to shake well before use. And um, you're gonna use that in direct sunlight. Obviously we're in a controlled environment. Two caps for light, dirty, four caps for heavy, dirty. Uh, two caps would be about 20 mLs. So I think this is a pretty clean car. So I'm gonna do two caps. I'm gonna to add to the bucket first. I like my cap caps. Trip. I like my caps that they clean. If I fail this test, I'm boycotting. <laughs> I would prefer to have a uh, very comfortable stool to sit on, but they can do with what we got. Comfortable unknown stool check. Do I get any extra credit for? I'm responsible for this existing in the world, or a large, you know, they at least get some credit for it. A little extra credit at the end. We did have the fun time of realizing what not stainless fittings do earlier today. All right, so I got my bucket of utensils and I got a bucket with some soap and water. And um, I'm using soap and water because I'm not familiar with these chemicals. And so I want to be cognizant of, um, of carbon ceramics. So the first thing I'm going to do is blow off all the dirt and debris uh, with a pressure washer. I always start the pressure washer away from the car, make sure that my nozzle doesn't fly off. For me, carbon ceramics are more about uh, getting the, uh, the, 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 you know, the fine particles, the, the, brake, the brake pad buildup, that's what tends to make them squeak. Especially these, uh, I think these are Gen 2 carbon ceramics from, from um, I'm gonna take the bucket. Ooh, it's nice working with warm water. We and, all, and inside. Yeah, uh, barrels first. If I can fit this behind here and I can't, this is why I hate wheel woolies. Can I become the sponsor of all skills verified trainings in the future? So then I would normally not revisit the bucket. Okay. That's why I don't like using a wheel bucket if I have the choice. I need a caliper. These appear to have been coated or waxed with something. God dang, what are you doing to me here? <laughs> Industry standard, my friend. Industry what, standard. I don't know what to do next. I'm gonna use my large wheelie, wheel woolly, clean the face of the wheel. <laughs> ergonomics god dang it you're killing me i feel like there's some rts out there who would enjoy this way more than me <laughs> but just listening to the audio is probably gonna be good enough for him <laughs> i knew that guy didn't know what he was doing back of the wheel face of the wheel it's clean i'm gonna take a tire brush i don't like to use this kind of stuff on the face of the wheel but that's just me i'm avoiding the lip as much as I can, that's why this is a great brush for this application. Next, I'll go find a razor blade and cut all these nibs off. 
they're getting in the way of the brush. The other thing I like to do in every wash, if I can, uh, wheel woolly isn't the best brush for that, but I like to clean the wheel wells as well. So, and rinse. In case you're wondering, this is dialed though roughly 1,000 PSI, about 990 PSI at about 1.8, 1.9 gallons a minute. At 40 degrees, it's real nice. Perfection. Real nice. So that's a clean wheel. I would repeat the procedure on all four. Uh, I would also, in this procedure, I would uh, do the same thing to the to the exhaust tips uh, to keep those keep those clean and um, uh, make sure they don't end up with buildup. So I'd use the, the same procedure throughout. Now working on such a a high grade automobile here, obviously we're just not going to let it sit. What would your personal choice be to dry the wheels? Wheel um, wells and tires. Uh, for, first, I would want to finish the whole car. Sure. So if this was in direct sunlight, I would revisit, try to hit it with some water mm -hmm. while I'm washing. Uh, if it wasn't, uh, so the car's done, uh, I'd like to blow it off with either a, a master blaster or a leaf blower. Okay. I prefer a leaf blower because um, you know I can I don't have to have any power cords or anything like that. Sure. Uh, and then at the end, after the cold car, I'd dry the entire car first, and then I'd dry the wheels and then dress the tires. It'd be the normal, normal if there process. was no, if there was no nibs on them, yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, the the nibs are going to be a real problem for me. <laughs> yeah. All right. So what do I do next? Do I tell you what I do next. Or do you tell me what I do? No. Next? So we are going to walk over to the back table because they're going to need the pressure washer to take care of the wheels. Okay. Uh, we'll go identify and talk some more theory. In the world of chemistry, mm -hmm. there's a lot of ways that we can do things and that we should do things. And there's a lot of ways that you could do things and really shouldn't do things. Okay. So with the products that are on the table, mm -hmm. can you identify what you would use potentially for tree sap? If you do not see that on the table, mm -hmm. then we're gonna talk about it in theory. So we have all purpose cleaner could be one. Um, you, first I would try with a regular soap to see if that worked. Sure. And if that didn't, then I could use uh, an all-purpose cleaner of some sort, um, or possibly a bug, a fallout, you know, bug remover of some sort. Uh, and it's not on the table, but uh, here you go. Yeah, a tar and glue remover. It okay. could probably be the suggested choice, and I would put it on the towel and treat, you know, and attempt to you know remove it. Sure. But the first thing I would do would be to try to wash it off without using some harsher chemical. So for bonus points, mm -hmm. what would be a, a possible solution from a corner pharmacy, CVS or Walgreens? Um, Goo Gone could be one. Okay. Um, possibly a dilute isopropyl alcohol could, uh -huh. be another, could be another choice. The little subliminal pro tip right there. So when you run out and your detail vendor's not around, you can't get it from the internet, you, you got to get the sap off, off the CVS you go, you nailed it. Yep. All right, how about let's talk about tar. Okay. Tar, uh, let's see, do we have an actual, yeah, tar, tar and glue remover. So we're lucky that we have this specifically, um, or I'd, I'd probably dilute some all-purpose cleaner if I didn't have that. Okay. You know, if we're going to talk that. about chemically removing it, as we just did, mm -hmm. um, for both the sap and or the tar, um, from the mechanical side of, our, of what we do, mm -hmm. what are some mechanical tools or equipment that we could use that would help us with? I mean, obviously, a microfiber towel. Um, or uh, we don't have it on the table here, but we have the, uh, I could use a wash mitt. Mm -hmm. So I wanna make sure it's clean first. Uh, and then if it's clean, I can use either a clay bar okay. or a clay towel, you know, rubber towel of some sort, or, you know, Auto Scrub is a, is a company that makes this kind of stuff, uh, or some sort of clay mitt. Sure. I would not use something like a stiff bristle, br bristled brush. All right, industrial fallout. Mm -hmm. So we'll find a product and then we'll talk about a process. Okay. Uh, iron remover of some sort, which would be sodium thiglocolate based. So iron in general fallout remover from this company. Sure. And, and um, process would be, uh, I would wash the car first with a regular soap. Uh, I would then, you know, rinse. And then for most, for, for the, the most effective treatment of fallout, you should probably blow dry and maybe dry the car. I generally don't need to do that because like cars like this are, sure. are in better condition. But we'll go so back to the, we'll go to heavy for the Camry. 
Yeah, so on, on a Camry, I, I, I would probably just blow dry it with my leaf blower or my, mm -hmm. you know, my Master Blaster or Big Boy or something like that. Uh, and then I would uh, spray this on. And uh, for the Camry that I'm not too concerned, I'd probably just spray it on and let it on for about five minutes and then rinse it off. On this car, I would probably put my gloves light. on. Light. Well, but uh, you know, on this, I would do the same process, but I would actually massage and make sure it got covered every square inch of it. So, over near Orlando, middle of Florida, uh -huh. you've got to be a bug expert by now. Mm -hmm. So let's talk about bugs chemically. Let's remove them. So um, you could use a bug remover. Um, that would be the simplest thing. So um, let's say that the car was dry mm -hmm. and I drove to Cars and Coffee. I got some bugs on it. I don't have access to a pressure washer. Um, what I would use um, is uh, I wouldn't use a bug remover. I'd use something like a quick detailer. And I would take a microfiber towel. I would fold it in eighths. So I'd hopefully have this behind my seat. Mm -hmm. uh, maybe if I'm lucky, I'll have some uh, a product like a, like a polymer-based detail spray, like a optimum no rinse or something mm -hmm. like that. I'd fold my towel in eighths. I would spray the bug area down. I want to get the surface clean first. So I want to get the sand and grit removed because uh, I don't want to scratch the, the paint if I can help it. Uh, and then, so I'll use the first side to do a really soft, gentle, just using the towel to pull and grab and get, a, get all the dirt off the surface. I'd hit it with a little bit more quick detailer. I would wipe again, inspect, make sure it was completely clean and devoid of any sand or grit. Then I would flip my towel over to the other clean side, and now I'd attack the bug with the detail spray. You know, using as little pressure as possible would be generally how I would do it. If I was doing a normal wash procedure, I would hope that my coating or wax or the stuff on, on the surface would allow me to simply wash the car as normal and wipe away in the wash process. After the fact, I'd use my drying aid or a quick detailer to attack any bugs that might be left over after the car is clean. But my procedure would never be um, just trying to chase the bug, even on a Camry, if the surface was all dirty. So this one, a couple of different answers for a couple of different scenarios. So let's just say, the neighbor over there at the obsessed garage mm -hmm. was painting his fence. Okay. And the wind came, and we have all of this overspray now. Got it. And you come to find out that it is just a latex overspray. Okay. Okay. So I'd wash the car first, you know, same idea of getting all the sand and grit and dirt off the car. I'd then dry the car. Uh, and then I would use, um, for that, I would prefer to use a clay bar mm -hmm. and a detail spray as a lubricant. Um, I prefer to do the full wash and not skip the step of uh, like what you could do. What I could do is just wash it and use the soap as my lubricant. Mm -hmm. I'd prefer to wash the car, dry the car, or you know at least at least get all the soap off the car, and then use a quick detailer with a clay bar. I find that a clay bar does a better job of removing those kind of surface contaminants like overspray. Cool. You could use a towel as well, but it may not be as effective. Got it. Um, back to the Camry, mm -hmm. All right. some hardcore road film, just, it's just, it's just there. Mm -hmm. You washed it, you're not satisfied. Mm -hmm. Well, consider considered a deep cleaning? Um, a probably all purpose cleaner or some sort of, um, some sort of pH of, you know, at least, you know, nine or 10, something with a higher pH would allow me to hopefully remove that, that film or the dirt or tar or oil or gas or whatever's on the surface. All right. So. I know we're in the wash but here mm -hmm. at Merit Partners. Um, I think this is a great place to work on this exercise. We do have a hard time with this. We usually show photos, right? Mm -hmm. But I think because we're here and we have a camera to follow us, um, we're gonna identify um, the different types of wheels. Okay. Right? So first and foremost, we're gonna look for a painted, clear-coated wheel. Okay. Well, here's a big one right here. We found one. Clear, clear coat. Okay. Could be powder coat. Powder coat and clear coat are a little hard to discern, but generally sure. Porsche wheels are, are painted. Okay. So we'll go look for an uncoated aluminum wheel. Oh, shoot. Let's see. Looks like we have one right on the, uh, is that a Defender? Mm. It is painted. So how would you be able to tell? Because you believe that walking over, you walked over with a mission. Mm -hmm. Well, it's shiny, and I can't see, I can't see the metal grain, if you will. So it looks like this is finished in okay. some sort of gray paint. So I doubt there's going to be anything in here. 
even the Fuchs, you know, Singer wheels, um, that looks like bare aluminum on the front, on the face. Sure. Okay. And then how about, um, how about a chrome? There may not be much chrome here. Yeah. Um, but how would you well, identify chrome? Chrome almost looks like plastic. You know, you can usually, you can usually, you know, flick it and kind of tell. Um, mm -hmm. But in chrome, especially if it's an older car, may have some bubbling. Um, that's how I would generally decide if it's chrome. A lot of chrome on the on the vets out there, right? <laughs> yeah, not mine, <laughs> but yeah, some of them. Difference between a multi-piece wheel versus a single-piece wheel. Mm -hmm. Well, like, how do I identify it? Yes. And there will be bolts, screws, you know, around the perimeter of the rim. Bolts usually made of plastic? No, metal. Okay. You know, it's usually, yeah, usually of aluminum, hopefully. Okay. Extra credit points as, as we walk back. Mm -hmm. Lugs versus center lock. Uh, well, center lock on the GT2 there, and lugs would be on the GT3 RS. So if a detailer was going to get into the Porsche game, Mm -hmm. and they start seeing a bunch of center locks, what is something that they would probably look at investing in? Um, yeah, you want to be careful with that. But if I was going to do it, I would buy, uh, the car needs to be up in the air, so I got to have a floor jack. I probably, first I need pucks so I can jack in the proper jacking point of a Porsche. Then um, I need to get the car in the air, so I might invest in um, um, something like quick jacks or something like that, or a scissor lift. Sure. Uh, and then from there, you need a three quarter inch like roughly four foot breaker bar in order to break that loose. And then I would need to know to look up, to look up the torque specs, 443 foot pounds, I think. <laughs> now that is just super extra credit, but we'll take <laughs> yeah, it. Yeah, better get extra points for that. It's four, it's four, roughly 440 foot pounds would be the torque spec you'd need to tighten. And then it's righty tighty lefty loosey on that one. All right. You, sir, are done with test one. What's, oh, there's more than one test? There's three. Oh, okay. Did I pass? I don't know yet. <laughs> okay. Do we want to wash the car? Yeah, well, if you're supposed to, then yeah. Yeah, we're, we're supposed to. So there are two ways you can do this, right? You can do it theoretically, or you can do we it We did physically. a little bit of both, yeah. We did a little bit. We hit the theory. We killed the theory. But it's subjective to you as the RT. Yes, correct. So we did skip number four, because we got right into the proper cleaning of the wheels and so on and so forth. Okay. So let's go back to number four, which I would have caught by the end. Okay. And maybe I'm a little rusty, but that's okay. That's okay. why we're here. All right, so. Show me how you are going to wash this car. All right, I'm going to get my buckets prepared. So I'm not going to use my wheel bucket. If I, if I didn't have an extra bucket here, I would dump this out and start fresh. I'm going to steal the grit, the grit guard here. You guys are being so quiet and patient. You remember, we have lab mics on, so like they can't hear you even if you were banging stuff <laughs> around. So I've got wash mitt and washboard, but grit guard. Wash and then grit guard in the uh, in this. So we're going to call this our rinse bucket. Okay. We're going to call this our wash bucket. Sure. So bucket one, bucket two. I'm sure I'll forget, but got to fill these up. I'm going to use car shampoo. Car's pretty clean. I'm going to follow the instructions. The instructions tell me that I need two capfuls for a light dirt four caps for heavy. I might suggest to a company that might end in a G and end in a Q that we get some sort of dispenser for this bottle, but that's just me. Duly noted. But we are purely agnostic in this test. That is what electrical tape is for. We use what we got. I also might suggest as a detailer that, that um, I clean my bottles and I line it back up and have the numbers <laughs> facing out, but that's just me. Dialing it in, per se. So for camera's sake, mm -hmm. I would think we would do the, you could do the front quarter of the driver's side or the back quarter of the driver's side, then we'll pull in the stage hands Got it. The stage hand for, detail team. For testing purposes, top down. Cleanest areas first, dirtiest areas last. Okay. For extra credit for me. I'm always going to inspect my wash mitt, make sure there isn't anything that could cause damage. I only use a clean wash mitt, so I would, you know, wouldn't use this on a second car. I'd go wash it in the washer and dryer. In case that matters. 
I'm gonna use a pressure washer setup. Again, I happen to be a pressure washer kind of guy. So this has been tuned to make sure that I don't damage the paint. There's a couple of procedures I would follow to make sure, one, I don't wanna be smacking my hose off so I'd pull out excess hose to make sure that doesn't happen. Another thing is pointing at the, gun, at the ground first just in case the tip were to fail and fall off and I wanna shoot it at this really expensive car or somebody's beloved Camry. I've never washed a Camry and don't intend to ever wash one, <laughs> in case that matters. Oh, I can't wait to see the comments for that one. I may or may not have calculated specifically the length of the wand that I wanna use on my gun, but we want 20, 20 inch, it's like 20 degree bend. Quick disconnects. Again, point at the ground first. Common procedure. Make sure straight. Rinse, rinse first. I'm glad you gave me a coated car to work on. <laughs> I wonder if this has something that ends in a, starts with a G, ends in a Q on it, you think? Is that possible? One of those things that's hard to tell. I always want to be cognizant of my distance. I don't want to be up on the paint. Even though this is safe, still, I don't want to risk it. Notice how important a swivel is so that your hose doesn't get all bound up. Just saying. Wasn't a believer until I tried it myself. <laughs> All right, so I've rinsed off as much dirt and debris as I could from you know, the rinse phase. And then the purpose of the two bucket method is to hopefully alleviate, not eliminate, it doesn't eliminate it, but alleviate the chance of micro marring from dirt and debris. I don't like mitts, so I do this. Make it a brick. So I'm grab soap. Um, let's just say, hypothetically speaking. Let's. Uh, normally it, I would use a foam cannon and foam it down, but not a necessary super, step. Yeah. If it was super dirty. Yeah. This is so clean that I'm not even going to worry about foaming it, but normally I would foam the car. It's debatable whether or not that does anything uh, sure. outside of looking really cute. This is coming from the self-proclaimed king of foaming. And I'm going to flip the sponge often, you know, revisit my buckets often, rinse, rub it up against my washboard, which I don't like doing that, but just in case that was on the test. I'm going to clean top down. On a car like this, I don't find any need. There won't really be any need for any pressure. So if there were any bugs or anything left over after this, then I'd, I'd rather address bugs with some pressure and a microfiber towel after the surface has been cleaned and rinsed rather than trying to get it now. Sure. And so rather than working on like that whole side of the car, I think it's smarter to go top down. It's cleaner on top generally than it will be down low. And I also don't want to do massive areas before revisiting the bucket again. This car's really big. <laughs> Jeez. You're going to get me really in trouble with you know, people accusing me of washing clean cars. And we got some rental minivans outside. <laughs> it so has been a long four days though. So washing procedure would you know, include that process, revisiting the buckets often, and possibly re-agitating the soap if necessary, and then rinse afterwards. Wonderful. Stage hands up. Ex once, exit once again, right. Once again, we have completed test one after a little slight mix up okay. of the numbers. Got it. So. Kind of sissy washes her car with gloves on. <laughs> Someone with delicate skin. <laughs> okay, so while they're doing that, in front of me I have three items that you could use to dry the car. Mm -hmm. um, pick which one you would use first. There's, yeah, the, um, I there's guess a ringer again. A bigger, heavier pile towel to, okay. draw, to sop up most of the water and then follow with a smaller, more manageable towel to sure. finish, finish wipe. Um, in the world of mechanical, have you seen the rubber blades or any of that kind of stuff. Yeah, I've used that in the past, but yeah, I do not recommend anything abrasive. Okay. The least abrasive possible. In fact, I would use a detail spray or a drying aid of some sort uh, to lubricate, you know, the surface 
if I could, and also add a little extra layer of protection to leave behind. Gotcha. So I think we're going to go a little bit quicker through this one. Yeah. So we already talked about question one, which is selection of clay bar prep towel and lubrication. Mm -hmm. You already hit that in test one. Yep. Um, you already talked about the ability to explain the claying of the surface. We yes. went into that pretty good, yep. I believe. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, and you hit number three already, which was talking about the clay bar versus the clay towel. Yes. So we got that. So paint reconditioning. Okay. We have our table next to us here. Mm -hmm. So paint. we could do this theoretical, I think would be okay, don't you? I, I mean, I think so. Okay. I think so. I think people have seen you polish cars before. Yeah, yeah. got it. So in the world of compounds and polishes, mm -hmm. let's get these in some sort of order here. From the most aggressive to the least? Yeah, we can go that way. Okay. So we got cut. So this would be a cutting and heavy stage correction. I'd usually just kind of read the bottle. It'll tell you what it is. So that sure. this, this company has a one and a two. So one would be more aggressive, two would be less aggressive. So that one's, that one's called fine. These, this is coarse. I would think that that would mean more aggressive. This system here would make sense that this looks like a more aggressive pad. So I would put my coarse polishes here and my finishing polishes like this. Okay. So we'd go from, actually it would probably go like this. Most aggressive to least aggressive. Gotcha. In the world of pads, mm -hmm. can you tell me the difference between what's going on here on the table? Sure. So we have microfiber and foam. So we have five foam pads and one microfiber pad. Um, a little more difficult to tell, but generally a white microfiber pad would be a cutting pad. Mm -hmm. um, we don't know the, the level of aggression. Usually orange would mean heavier cut. So this I would call my cutting pad, which I would use as my more aggressive. This I can tell is a more aggressive cutting foam pad mm -hmm. uh, and it would make sense that blue would go with blue here. A lot of companies you see doing that now. Yeah, yeah. so the, a lot of companies have a system. Uh, and so this, this type of foam, you can tell because the cell structure is open mm -hmm. versus this is much more, uh, much smoother. Uh, and so this would be a finishing pad and it's also softer. So if we, were, if we were going to um, fix some minor defects on the Carrera GT behind you, mm -hmm. what would be your first? I would start with uh, something less aggressive to see it would work. So I'd work from least aggressive up to most aggressive. So I would start with likely yellow and probably a medium yellow pad and okay. see what happened and, and address the surface. Uh, and then if this didn't get satisfactory results, then I might go to a heavier cut and probably a microfiber pad and see what happens there uh, and then make an educated decision on you know which you know, vis make a visual decision on which would be better the, the stage crews are still whispering behind us while they take care of the car all right if there was a um a synthetic or a natural wool pad on the table, which mm -hmm. we don't have. Mm -hmm. Would that be least aggressive or would that be most aggressive? Well, it depends. Um, the, uh, they have both. So they have medium aggression wool pads or, or more aggressive. Generally, it would be microfiber most aggressive, then wool in between, and then depending on your, on your foam pads. Okay. Um, it also depends on the machine too. You know, I could have a synthetic type wool pad and put it on a rotary, and it may be more aggressive uh, than, uh, than a microfiber pad on a dual action polisher, depending on the, the, ty the type. In the worlds of, um, of the all-in-ones out there, or as we say on the test, the cleaner waxes, okay. what would be a good pad on the table for a cleaner wax? Uh, all-in-one cleaner wax would be you know, a yellow pad, probably. Sure. This kind of a medium polishing pad, something that wasn't super, super soft, but something kind of in between. And if you were going to machine apply a sealant or a natural or carnauba wax product? Well, as soft pad. as possible, so this white pad would be the one I'd choose. Okay, a couple of different types of, per the test, buffers. So we're just going to eliminate that and just say machines. Okay. Um, can you identify on the table a DA or a random orbital machine? That's this one, LHR15. And what 22. makes you think that? Um, I can tell by, generally by this, by moving the, the motion, or I can just read it generally. I know the model <laughs> numbers. Um, what if we covered that with tape as well? Yeah, and so this I can tell is a direct drive machine where this is free spinning. Okay. 
And which one of them would you say is a rotary machine or a rotary buffer? Yeah, let's try 19. Perfect. All right, so um, the guys are going to dry the car. You already identified how to do so. Got it. Right. Um, and we are going to talk about, in theory, the correct buffing technique. Again, everyone, I believe, has seen you polish enough. Okay. So if you want to, with this car, again, in theory, mm -hmm. um, we are, we've noticed once we dried it that there is just very, very slight marring mm -hmm. for maybe someone, you know, not using enough of something or just doing their technique wrong. Mm -hmm. um, so what machine would you use? What pads would you use? What liquid abrasive or product would you use? And can you show me to put that all together? Yeah, minor, I would do a dual action polisher. Um, and again, I would choose, I would choose probably a yellow pad and I would choose one a little taller like this. You know, this is actually a pad for a force rotation machine. So it really doesn't belong on here, but you could choose something like this. You'll get a little bit more cut from this, this, this shorter pad. And I would use a uh, you know, yellow fine polish for minor defect removal. Gotcha. So we're using what we got, right? We already yes. know that's not the perfect pad for the machine. So um, I would use the dual action version of this pad correct. with this machine. Clearly that's been used before, but let's just say, again, in theory, it's brand new. Yep. So what would you do first before going over to the car? Um, oh, I would, uh, I would inspect the pad, make sure there's nothing on it. I might actually blow it off with some pressed air. Okay. Uh, and then I would- I'd say uh, that's, that's extra credit. Okay. Yeah. I like that. And then I would prime the pad by putting okay. some polish on it first. I prime the pad on the surface. I learned that from Jason Rose. So I would put a couple of dots of product here, here. I turn the speed of the machine down to speed two, which Jason Rose calls the priming position. And then I would, you know, operate with no pressure. Just let it, you know, let it work the product in. I'd inspect. And then I would uh, add a few more drops if it looked like I had even coverage and then I would begin my polishing procedure. Sure. So first things first, you can, the machine goes over to the car, you're primed. Mm -hmm. How much of the car are you working on? Uh, generally a two foot by two foot section, you know, depending on the type of uh, curve. You know, I might treat a smaller area if there was a, an aggressive curve of some sort, you know, I'd avoid the headlights. But um, if it was a flat panel like this, I would section the, the hood off probably in, in at least four, maybe six sections for that, that okay. hood. What are some areas on the nose of the vehicle here that you would consider a concern, not a worry, but a concern would be a little extra careful of and how would you deal with that? Um, you know, I want to be careful here, you know, as I'm depending on the size of the machine I was using, I want to be careful that I didn't hit the backing plate on the edge here. I would probably run a piece of tape here uh, and I would actually probably tape this, polish this and then remove the tape tape here, polish this so that I didn't end up hitting another area could be problematic in here, up in here. Um, I want to try to avoid getting polished, depending on the type of polish all over the plastic. Um, you know, I'd tape off the emblems just so I didn't cake this up with, with product. Sure. And then the headlights, uh, you know, I want to polish the headlights. All right, you're done with your two foot by two foot panel as you described. Yep. What are we going to use for removal? Uh, microfiber towel. I'm generally going to fold in eighths and wipe gently. Um, and then, uh, you know, depending on how heavy the defects are and the, the color, um, I would probably do something like a uh, like isopropyl alcohol-based solution to, you know, remove any polish residue, so I can inspect and make sure that. You know, there wasn't any filling or anything like that. Make sure I actually removed the, the defects. And I wasn't just looking at a oil slick surface, if you will. Sure. Anything else when you were done with that wipe that you would use to check what you're doing? Um, I'd use some sort of inspection light. In here, I could probably use overhead lights to, you know, depending on where I was at, I couldn't use the overhead light on the front bumper, but I could use it here to inspect my work or use a, a light at a, you know, opposite me a scan grip light or a Phoenix light or something like that to inspect. On this color paint, I would probably want to use something that was like, uh, you know, yellower. So around you know, 2,700, maybe 3,000 Kelvin, you know, just depending on how I'd, I'd try some different, different shades. But on silver, I'd rather use a more yellow light on a black or something. I might use a bluer or whiter light.